It's called the North America Nebula. There's Florida, there's the Gulf of Mexico, there's Mexico, there's the Yucatan Peninsula. So that's up uh, just um, uh, that's up above our own sky in the middle of the summer. And you know, again, you can't see this with the naked eye so well. It would be a very dim green smudge, but photographic film brings out all these brilliant colors quite well. This is a different type of ne nebula. This is called the Ring Nebula, which is not a particularly imaginative name. That little dot there is the star that once upon a time had a supernova, and this is still the expanding shell of gas that's moving beyond. And you can see this one in Lyra, which is also above the sky in the middle of the summer. I point out a lot of things that are above the sky in the middle of the summer because I'm not one of those astronomy geeks who likes to go out in the middle of the freezing winter. When it takes 20 minutes to set up your telescope equipment, you can't stand it unless it's nice weather. This is called a globular cluster. I showed you the Pleiades, which was an open cluster. These are much farther out. In fact, these are almost like little mosquitoes flying around our own galaxy. They're not right within our galaxy, so they're almost like their own little mini galaxies, but a lot of stars that are gravitationally attracted. This one is M13 in the Hercules constellation, which is pretty much right overhead around midnight in the middle of the summer. And if you have a good-sized telescope, you can see this. With binoculars, it'll just look like a bit of a fuzzy snowball. But very impressive to see these with your own eyes. Now, though, where are we going to go beyond that? So now we've really just explored our own galaxy. Well, then we're going to have to start looking at other galaxies. This is Andromeda, which is the only galaxy you can see beyond our own with the naked eye. It's about 2.2 million years that the light took to get from there to your own eyes. And you can see this with the naked eye if it's a dark sky up in the Muskokas with no moon. It's about three moon diameters from end to end. And with binoculars, you can start to appreciate this sort of appearance. And with a telescope, you'll definitely appreciate a bright center. And again, we're looking at all of these stars within our own galaxy to peer past it to see that galaxy. This is another galaxy. This one's about 70 million light years away. That means dinosaurs were walking on planet Earth when the photons that hit this photographic film took off from this galaxy. This one is nice because it's, it's very comparable to the Milky Way galaxy. If we could see our own galaxy from overhead, our own solar system would be something comparable to here. It's about two-thirds out from the center between two spiral arms, so we don't have as many stars to see in the night sky as if we were right in a spiral arm. But that's what our galaxy would look like if we could actually take a picture of it. But we can look at our own galaxy. A lot of people don't even realize we can see the Milky Way. If you look due south in the middle of summer, again on a nice dark night, you can see there's Sagittarius. It's supposed to be an archer, but I think it looks more like a little teapot there. There's the spout and there's the handle. And all of the steam that comes out of the teapot is the Milky Way galaxy. That's pretty much the center of our galaxy. It's not as bright there because there's a lot of dust obscuring it, so it gets dark. You can see Scorpio out here as well. So if you can, it does not take long for your eyes to accustom themselves so that you can see this with the naked eye, but you've got to be away from the bright light pollution. Does anybody know what this is? Well, you'll be happy to know this is my last slide. In 1977, Voyager 1 left Earth to look at all the gas giants that are out there. It was just kind of convenient that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were sort of lined up. So it went past one and took pictures of it and then slung shot past it to the next one and so on and so on. And most of the pictures you've seen of the gas giants have been from Voyager spacecraft. Well, in 1990, it had sort of done its job. It was about 5 billion miles away from Earth. And it came up with the neat idea, let's look back at home and see our own little planet there. So I said earlier on I was going to make it so that you would see the night sky in a different way, that you would never look at the sky the same way again. And I think in some ways maybe I've helped you with that. But I think this speaks to a lot of interesting things. And I, I, Carl Sagan was a big impact for me in my life. Um, when I watched Cosmos when I was in high school, it certainly gave me a love of astronomy, but it also gave me a love for science, which ultimately steered me towards medicine and cardiology. And uh, he talked about this, so I can't do his words justice. 
So I'm just going to read them to you, what he said at a commencement address about this very same picture back just eight months before he died back in 1996. And if you wonder why astronomy has anything to do with giving and doing what we're doing here tonight, raising funds to try and make this world a better place, I think this slide will help you understand. <clears throat> so without any further ado, Carl Sagan. Look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely indistinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you clear skies.